Welcome back to the Current Directions in Psychological Science Speaker Series, which is being presented by Pearson and APS. To get started, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. James Pennebaker from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Pennebaker's early research focused on how writing about emotional upheavals can improve people's physical and psychological health. His more recent work examines the links between natural language and psychological states. He has published hundreds of research articles and nine books. He has an active research lab that is routinely funded by the National Science Foundation, as well as federal agencies associated with espionage, defense, and national security. So um, in this session, Dr. Pennebaker will discuss how our words reflect who we are. Well, it's, uh, it's nice to be part of this system. Um, as as uh, was pointed out, my work deals with how words we use in everyday life reflect our, our psychological and social state. Now, I need to, to warn you and perhaps make you a little bit nervous that uh, I'm not a linguist. I'm really not going to interest, I'm not going to talk about pronouns per se or parts of speech, partly because I don't understand them that well. But I am, I'm a social psychologist, and I'm really interested in understanding how people are thinking, how they're communicating with others, how they understand others. And through an odd quirk, I ended up uh, falling into the, word, the world of, uh, of words. By way of background, uh, I started uh, my research many years ago, and I was interested in mind-body problems, essentially how psychological states influence biological change. And we know that that's true. We know when we experience an emotion, when we see something upsetting, our heart rate goes up and so forth. And I was interested in, I ended up through an interesting twist, interested in the nature of traumatic experience. And I discovered that if people had a traumatic experience, they had all sorts of health problems. I didn't discover that. That had been known for quite a while. But I discovered that people who had had some kind of traumatic experience that they had kept secret were particularly prone to traumas. And we discovered this uh, by looking at individuals who reported having a traumatic sexual experience prior to the age of 17. And when we, did, when we, we studied these people, we found they had every kind of health problem imaginable. And it turned out that one of the reasons for this was that they were keeping that secret, and in keeping this important issue secret, they were essentially isolating them from the rest of their, their friendship networks, their family, and so forth. And we started expanding this more and more, and at some point I started to ask the question, well, what would happen if, if you asked people to talk about their traumatic experience or talk about their secrets? Well, talking was too much work to do in the lab, so I just defined the thought, uh, designed an experiment where we had people come into the lab and, and talk or, or actually write about a traumatic experience, ideally one that they had kept secret. And we compared that with another group of people that were randomly assigned to write about superficial topics. And what we found, and this was kind of the beginning of the expressive writing method, is that people who were asked to write about traumatic experiences later showed improvements in physical health. They went to the doctor less. There, was, there were improved improvements in immune function, all sorts of changes with them. It was really quite dramatic. That, was, that study was first done in the mid-'80s, and then other labs started to catch on and start doing similar research. And by the early 90s, it was clear there was something really big here. But what we, none of us knew was, why does writing make such a difference. Not only did people's health improve, but we found that their immune system improved, their other biological markers changed, they ended up doing better in college, they started, they were more creative afterwards, they start, started thinking better and so forth. So a number of studies by a lot of labs were done to try to find the active ingredient. And one of the questions I asked was, is it possible to read a person's essay, a traumatic experience essay, and glean from that who might benefit? In other words, not everybody benefits. Can we identify healthy writing from unhealthy writing? Early on, we started to test this idea uh, by having judges just read these traumatic essays. 
And we found that judges just didn't agree very much on the components of a, an essay. Is it a good essay or a bad essay? Was the person self-reflective? We just, people just couldn't agree. So what we did instead was to develop a computerized text analysis program to start analyzing these texts. And this computer program we later called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, L-I-W-C. And we pronounced that Luke. And the Luke computer program ended up being this remarkably simple kind of program where it would go in and look at any given essay and it would calculate the percentage of words in an essay that were uh, positive emotion words or negative emotion words or cognitive words or, you know, and as long as we were doing this, we'd have it calculate percentage of pronouns and prepositions and articles and conjunctions and so forth. Well, after developing this, we went back to some of our traumatic essays and we started to see some findings that were quite intriguing. One was that people who benefited more from writing tended to use more positive emotion words than people who did not benefit. So if you can write about a horrible experience and still use words like love, care, happy, you're more likely to benefit. But that effect was pretty minor compared to some of the other findings. One was that we found the more that people used thinking words or cognitive words, words that suggested cause and effect thinking, words like because, cause, effect, reason, rationale, if they increased in their use of those words from the first day to the last, their health tended to improve the most. Almost as though if people were constructing a story over the four days of writing, the more they benefited. And then we started discovering other odd findings. And one was the way that people use pronouns. That if on one day they use first person singular pronouns like I, me, and my at high rates, and the next day they made references to other people, he, she, they, we, the person who flipped in their use of pronouns from day to day benefited a lot more than people who used the same kind of pronouns across all four days. And I think part of that is that reflected people's ability to switch perspectives. If you're writing about an upsetting experience, being able to look at it from different perspectives seems to be particularly important. Now another interesting offshoot of that project was that I had been doing other studies at the same time. I'd been analyzing everything from newspaper articles to books to lyrics to um, memoirs to emails and so forth. And I was discovering some things that just didn't make sense. And some of these, or many of these findings, all seemed to center around really small words, pronouns kept popping up, but also articles, words like A, N, and B, and also words, you know, prepositions, and, you know, all these little junk words that nobody cares about. And as I got into this more and more, I realized that these kinds of words really uh, were a, a class of words by themselves, and linguists generally refer to them as function words. Now, function words, it turns out, oh yeah, I've got this thing, look at this. Function words can be distinguished from content words. Content words are the words that we usually, that we rely on when we're conveying ideas. These are usually nouns and regular verbs and some adjectives and some adverbs. But these function words were, there weren't that many, there are not that many in English. They included pronouns and articles and prepositions, auxiliary verbs and other, other words. And in English, there honestly are only about 150, 180 common ones. There, there are more than that, but the common ones are about 150 or 180 words. Now here's what's interesting. First of all, these words are processed in the brain differently. If you have taken that introductory psychology or a higher level psychology, you probably remember vaguely that there are two important language areas in the uh, generally on the left side of the brain. Tempor the temporal lobe, which is uh, kind of right above your, the ear, or, uh, and that has Wernicke's area. And then there's another area, Broca's area, which is tends to be more in the, in the frontal direction, actually in the frontal lobe. And it turns out these two areas, if they're damaged, produce really different deficits in people. So a person who has damage to their frontal lobe, to Broca's area, if they're asked to describe something, 
they, it turns out they use words like nouns and regular verbs a lot. So I have a table sitting in front of me, and if I had damage to my Broca's area, I might, if I was asked to describe it, I might say uh, table, uh, papers, uh, red box. In other words, it would be a, a stilted kind of description of things. However, if I had damage to Wernicke's area, that is in the temporal lobe, but my Broca's area in the frontal lobe was working just fine and was asked to describe it, I would talk very differently. I'd be much more socially skilled in my discussion. I'd say, oh yeah, uh, well, right over there is this, and next to that is that, is that one over there, and it's above, that one is over, yeah, this, yeah over there. Yeah, you. In other words, I'd be using primarily function words. But function words are interesting because they don't convey really solid information. And in fact, these function words are really social. It's, it, it's a little bit like talking about, uh, if I'm making reference to the table in front of me, and I talk about the table this, and in a few minutes I refer to the table, that everybody who's listening to me now would know which table I'm talking about. Now, after this this webinar, let's say you go t tell a friend about hearing this webinar and you heard Pennebaker talk about the table. Well, your friend's going to say, what do you mean the table? The table refers to a particular table that you and I know about right now. And if I make reference to it, you and I know what that it is. And if there is another person in the room and I say, oh, let me introduce so-and-so, she is from another department, we would know who she is. Pronouns, prepositions, articles, etc., are words that are socially shared, and they have meaning to us right now. Now, what that means is, is that these function words require social skills to use, to understand, and at the same time, they convey a great deal about how the speaker is thinking, how the speaker is connecting to other people, and to the objects or, or whatever that the, the speaker is talking about. Well, this led me to now start looking at these function words in a completely new way. We had a computer program that could analyze emails or uh, virtually anything. And immediately, we could get a sense of the differences between people. So for example, we could look at uh, differences between men and women. And I often give talks, and I ask audiences to, to make it a guess about men and women in terms of how they use words. And you can do this little test of yourself right now. And this test is, who uses the following words more, men or women? OK? I words. This is I, me, and my. How about we words? We, us, and our. Men or women. Who uses those more? How about articles, A, N, and the? How about social words, he, she, they? What about um, uh, cognitive words, because, cause, effect, reason, rationale, or emotion words? Now, if you're like virtually every audience I've ever spoken to, it turns out you probably have just gotten all of those wrong except for one. You got social words right. Social words, women use social words more than men do. I words, women use those more. We words, it's a trick question, there's no difference. Um, cognitive words, women use cognitive words more. Emotion words, there's no difference. Articles, men use them, them more. Now, once I explain this, it'll make sense. Pronouns are, pronouns are important because they tell us where people are paying attention. A person who uses the word I is paying attention to self. Now, you're thinking, well, men are, are uh, you know, narcissistic uh, people who are obsessed with themselves. Well, that might be true. But the reality is they're not paying attention to themselves. They're not being self-reflective. They're not attentive to how they're feeling. And in fact, women are. And women across all cultures that we've studied use the word I at much higher rates than men do. In terms of we, us, and our, it turns out there's no difference because some of the time, we is used the way that we all think about, which is you and me together. We're in this together. Life is beautiful. But in fact, very often, we is used in a um, much colder, detached way. So for example, I might t say to my students, we need to analyze that data. 
Now, the reality is that doesn't mean let's you and I will sit down together and analyze the data. It really means you need to analyze the data. In other words, people and males especially often use we in this way to almost psychologically remove remove themselves from the interaction. Articles are fascinating. Articles A, N, and V, and I got to stop here for just a second and admit, if I had known 30 years ago that I'd be excited about articles, I'm pretty sure I would have quit my job and gone into um, you know, insurance or something. But it turns out articles really are kind of interesting. You use articles before a concrete down, and males use concrete nouns at much higher rates than, than women do. Women actually are much more interested in other human beings. And so men, will, whereas men are going to talk about B table, A carburetor, etc., women are more likely to talk about John and Fred and, and, and whomever. And you can get a sense of where a person is paying attention and how they're thinking about it by looking at things like articles or uh, other pronouns and social words. One of the other ones that I love are cognitive words, because, cause, effect, reason, rationale, words such as that. Words such as that suggest a person is actively thinking, actively trying to put the, the world together. And we find that when people don't know what's happening and they're trying to figure it out, they use these words at high rates. Well, what's more complex? human relationships, which women tend to talk about more, or objects and things like carburetors. Well, it turns out human relations are far more complex than are carburetors. So you got a, a group of females, or males for that matter, talking about, you know, why has uh, Jennifer Lopez left this most recent guy when the other guy was so blah, blah, blah. blah. To analyze that requires tremendous cognitive resources. Whereas if you get a group of people analyzing a carburetor, that you can just imagine them all sitting around saying, carburetor broke, sand, flap. They don't, you, don't, you don't need really intense uh, intellectual discussions on why it works or doesn't work. Now to get, that gives you just a sense of how we can start looking at these words and start thinking about them as markers of psychological state. Well, we've taken it to many new directions. For example, is it possible to make to use language as a lie detector? And some of our early research has suggested yes. We've done studies where we ask people to write essays telling the truth or lying, or have have them uh, do a mock crime where we where we ask them to steal a small amount of money and then we interrogate them. Half the people actually did take the money, half of them didn't. And what we found, and now many other labs are finding, is that when people are telling the truth, they tend to use the word I more, I, me, and my. In other words, they tend to be owning what they're saying. They tend to be taking, uh, kind of absorbing what they're saying. And when they're lying, they psychologically distance themselves. So if uh, I'm asked if I took the money and I really did not take the money, I'll say, I did not take that money. I, I, I'm hurt that you're asking. Whereas if I did take the money on line, I might say something like, why are you asking me that? No self-respecting person would, would steal. In other words, I'm avoiding the question. I'm not answering it directly. There are other features of, of, of deception as well that, that is, are interesting as well. We also look at a lot at emotional issues. We find, for example, we did an analysis of poets, of published poets. So we looked at poets who committed suicide versus those who didn't. And, and it turns out uh, poets, published poets, commit suicide at incredibly high rates. And it's probably because people with bipolar disorder who are suffering from these wild fluctuations in mood are really drawn to poetry to try to understand their emotions better. In any case, by analyzing the poetry of suicidal and non-suicidal poets, we find that suicidal po poets do not differ from from non-suicidal in terms of negative emotion, which I was I was kind of expecting. In fact, they differ in their use of the word "I." A person who is deeply depressed is paying attention to themselves; they're aware of their their pain, is drawing their attention to themselves. 
So it turns out eye usage in poetry is a much better predictor of, of suicidal state than, um, than just about anything. And as you can imagine, we can take this into other dimensions in terms of personality and other individual differences. Now one other direction that we've been going in recently that I, I really love is looking at social dynamics. Can we start looking at the nature of language and see how it's related to so the social connections people have? So for example, we've been looking at something that we call language style matching or LSM. Language style matching is a method by which we look at the degree to which two people are using pronouns and articles and prepositions and so forth at similar rates. It's almost kind of a marker of people being on the same page in an interaction. And, there, and it's a fairly easy thing to calculate, if you, especially if you, if you have a computer. Well, one thing we've been curious about is, is this style matching a good way to estimate the connections people have. And one of the first places we looked at this was in speed dating. Most of you know what speed dating is. That in, in the heterosexual speed dating, you might have uh, 10 men, 10 women. Uh, one sex is sitting down at individual tables. The other sex walks in. And each person talks to each member of the opposite sex for four or five minutes. And then they each make ratings after each interaction. I was involved in a project with this where we actually uh, tape recorded all the conversations, and, and people knew we were doing that. What was interesting is that we were able to do this calculation in terms of their style matching, their LSM. And what we discovered was we could predict who would ultimately go on a date at rates higher than the people themselves. If they were connecting linguistically, they were much more likely to go on a date. We've done the same thing looking at young relationships, so young couples who've been dating for about six months. And we asked them to share their instant messages with us. We had about 80, 80, 85 couples. We could predict if that couple would still be together three months later at much higher rates than they could as well. And it was the, the difference was quite striking. We've been looking at this LSM idea among people who are in long-term relationships. We've been looking at it in terms of all sorts of groups. Can you, from a distance, study a group and figure out who the leader is? Yes. Can you figure out how well the group is working? Yes. And you can do this by this analysis of function words. Now, let me kind of finish this with a pitch. Psychology, what I love about psychology is it's a vibrant, exciting area. Now, one thing that has been, I think, has hindered psychology and many other disciplines for the last hundred years is we have gotten into kind of a silo mentality, which is in psychology, you need to study psychology. You need to take lots of psychology courses if you're going to be a great psychologist. And that might have been true 20 years ago. But the reality is the world is changing, and the most exciting work is going on at the edges. It's going on at the edges between psychology and other fields. You see this in neuroscience with psychology and biology and chemistry and pharmacy. And you see this also in the world that I've stumbled into on language. And the work that I'm doing connects with linguistics, communications, with um, engineering and computer science cognitive as well as social psychology. It's an incredible time to be alive. One thing I would urge those of you who are listening to start thinking about is how can we start thinking about language as a marker of psychological state? And one of the places I find this particularly exciting is looking at, at in other disciplines where they're bringing together new ways of analyzing language. One, of the one area I find particularly exciting is Google. And I would urge you to go to the Google website and go to the Google Labs just to see some of the, the, the projects that are available. For example, in December, there was an article published in Science that introduced the Google Books project. Right now, or at least as of a year ago, 12% uh, of all books ever published on Earth have now been added to the Google Book Project. And it's, you're able to go and search uh, the Google Books world and look for particular words. And you can see how the, the use of these words has 
changed. You can look at how often Milton versus Shakespeare has been referenced over the last three or four hundred years. You can look at at any concept and you can start to get an idea of how culturally psychology has changed. A similar type of thinking is Google Trends. Google Trends is a, is a uh, website that allows you to look at people's search terms. And you can get a sense of, again, if I'm angry, I'll probably be looking for angry things. And you can get a sense of how the entire culture has been looking looking up words related to anger, or if you're worried about illness, how it's related to illness. It's a remarkable way of thinking. Also, my lab has been doing a lot of work as well, coming up with new ways of thinking about language. And if you're interested in this, I have up on the slides right now a couple of interesting places you might go, where you're able to go in and just look at something like um, TA, there's a thematic apperception test, which you probably know about. You can go online and write something, and it, 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 you can analyze your own, or actually the computer will analyze your language in terms of uh, various motives, or how much you're in sync with somebody else. And I have a whole other set also just that you can go to of questionnaires and surveys and other online text analytics strategies at that last place at www.utpsych.org. One final issue. I teach introductory psychology, as does Kimberly Duff, who's going to be on right after me. I love it. Introductory psychology is an absolutely fabulous course, and it's, uh, there's nothing I would rather be teaching. And one thing that's rich about language is it's relevant to every area. It's, re it's relevant to developmental psychology, to cognitive, to social, to health. Uh, and and more than anything, I view it, this new language world as relevant to methods of new ways to think. And having students work with language in class and taking advantage of online computer systems, I think is a really smart way of going. So that's all I've got to say today. And uh, uh, I'm really pleased that I could uh, be part of this. Thank you all very much. So now we're going to switch gears. We're going to focus on um, our interactive part of the session, which will be led by master teacher Kimberly Duff. And so here what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how you bring this really interesting and exciting new science into your course. So Dr. Duff is uh, an award-winning professor at Cerritos Community College in California, where she teaches over 600 students each year, both online and in traditional classrooms. And she's also the author of a book, Think Social Psychology. So we're very happy to have her with us here today. I do have a few questions that were sent in ahead of time. And I think I'll start with one that ties into how Jamie ended his talk. And Kimberly, that question is, how can you incorporate this research into an introductory psychology course, especially if you do not teach a section on language? Great question. You know, one of the biggest challenges I think of teaching an introductory psychology course is trying to fit in all of the existing material. And then certainly when we hear about exciting research like uh, Dr. Pennerbaker's research on language, how do you incorporate some of that new research when maybe you don't consider yourself to be an expert in that area? Um, one of the things that I really like to do, and, and I'd be interested in getting some feedback from the students listening out there, is to do activities with the students on new research like this. Um, I'm going to switch over to uh, one of Dr. Pennebaker's uh, websites here, The Secret Life of Pronouns. And as he mentioned, he's got some great exercises. If you click on the link up here that says Exercises, you can actually, in the classroom or assign a writing assignment outside of the classroom, have students submit um, actual writing samples where they can get feedback. They can have it analyzed um, by his program. So one of the ones that I've been having fun with uh, with my students for the last couple of weeks is looking at the language style matching down here that looks at how in sync you are. Uh, it's fantastic because you can have students either generate writing samples or you can have them pull up instant messages or emails that they've used with their friends or their significant others. Okay, down here, if you click on click to begin writing, you can enter in some text.
and you can provide some other basic information. Was this an IM, an email, um, a writing sample that they did in the classroom? Uh, you can even uh, check here if you're in a relationship or not. Let's say this is a potential love interest. And you even get to kind of predict how in sync you think the people are. Of course, we would probably want to type in some more information here, but I'm just doing this um, in the essence of time so you can see the analysis that it will give back. And then you submit it, and pretty much right away, you're going to get feedback on how well um, these two people are related to one another in terms of their relationship. So you get a score immediately. And I think this can serve as a great launching point for talking about what language can tell us about social relationships. The other thing that I really like about Dr. Pennebaker's research, um, I'm really big in my class on emphasizing psychological science. And what I mean by that is sharing with students how psychological research is conducted. And so one of the things that I like about Dr. Pennebaker's research is it lends itself really well to being able to be replicated in the classroom. Um, if you were with us from the beginning of the talk, one of the studies that he talked about was a deception study um, where people either stole money or didn't steal money, and then they were asked to either tell the truth about what they did or lie about what they did. Um, this is really great because you can recreate this in the classroom. You can relate this to independent and dependent variables. You can have students you know, generate a hypothesis, who is going to use more pronouns, who will write a lengthier justification about what they did. And then you can have either the students count up the use of pronouns in the classroom, or again, you can go back to this website here, and using the exercises function, you can go in and have those writing samples actually analyzed. Great, thanks. Um, so now we have another question from an instructor. Um, and the question is that um, I have a really diverse student population. And she wants to know, are there implications for discussing cultural differences? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is really important to emphasize in the introductory psychology classroom. Um, and as Dr. Pennerbaker mentioned, um, he's found some really interesting um, differences with language style that replicates across cultures. So this might be a time to pull up a conversation about um, individualism and collectivism and have students kind of predict, do you think we would find these same type of language differences, for instance, between men and women, do you think that you would find them in other types of cultures? And then explore that. Uh, one of the other things that I know that uh, Dr. Pennerbaker and his team have investigated is looking at the use of personal pronouns with socioeconomic status. And I believe what they've found is that socioeconomic status is negatively correlated with the use of personal pronouns. So the lower one's socioeconomic status is the increased use of personal pronouns. And I think, again, this can serve as a really great lecture launcher for talking about potential cultural differences and what those mean to students. Great, thanks. So that was kind of focused more on a lecture launcher in the classroom. I have another question from an instructor who wants to know, uh, what if I don't have time to include any more material in the course in the classroom itself? Do you have any suggestions? That's, that's always a concern, I think, in introductory psychology, right? There's never enough time to, to add in more information. Um, I think being able to provide students um, either as a homework assignment or what I like to call extra learning, um, where it's not necessarily an assignment they're going to get points for, nor is it something that they're going to get extra credit for, but it's an assignment where they will learn more about the world of psychology. Um, what I would do is I would assign some of the readings on language style differences and have students, again, kind of like I would in the classroom, but if they don't have time in the classroom, have them submit a writing sample outside of the classroom and then come back and report to the class and maybe have a small group discussion about it. Um, having the students do the work outside of the classroom is great because they can learn that material. And then if the instructor does have time when they come back into the classroom, um, whether it's a small class of 30 students or a large lecture hall of 1,000 students, you can pair up students for maybe about five minutes and have them talk about what they found when they submitted their language sample. Um, I think it's also really important, um, even if you don't have time in the classroom, as Dr. Pennebaker was talking about, uh, to share with students how important language is and how it's related to many of the different fields within psychology. 
Um, so for instance, when we talk about intelligence, uh, we can talk about sex differences in language, right? So that men do better on spatial ability tasks, that women um, do better than men on some verbal tasks, and tie that back in with the language piece, and how does that inform us about some of these gender differences that we're seeing. Um, I know in his talk, Dr. Penner Baker talked about relating uh, his research to the social psychology chapter. Um, I think that's always a fun one for students, especially when we're focusing on relationships, looking at making predictions about dating. Um, that's something that always gets students engaged outside of the classroom um, because we're all in relationships. And so even if the instructor does not have time to incorporate that into their lecture, again, they can have students go off and apply this language research to their own relationship as an extra learning project. Great, thanks. And we just have a comment, um, but I'd like to read it. it. says, I also think that what you just said is a great way to get middle and high school students interested in psychology as a science, which is a great point. Um, so I have a question that just came in from a student. Um, and they are asking, uh, you know, if I'm interested in studying language and psychology, what kinds of courses should I be taking? Well, wow, that's an interesting question. Um, I would definitely uh, recommend looking at websites of different colleges and universities to see the course offerings that they have. But also importantly, take a look at the instructors of the course. Because for instance, if you were interested in language and you were applying to Dr. Pennebaker's institution, that would be really important for you to know about the research that he does. Um, it would be also really important for you to know whether or not the instructor brings in undergraduate students um, to work in their research laboratory to find out more about the particular work that they're doing. Beyond that, in terms of courses that you should take, um, if you can find a course, an undergraduate course in language, of course that would be fantastic. Um, but if not, certainly a course in cognitive psychology, I think would really give you in more information about language use. Thanks. Um, and then one more question, and I think you did touch on this already, but a little more clarification on, you know, if an instructor wants to show the application of this work outside of the research laboratory, what could they focus on? That's a great question. Um, I have to admit, when I was uh, talking with Jamie about his research, I thought, who would have thought that what we learned in English 101 in our grammar courses would, would be so exciting and so sexy um, and, importantly, uh, so uh, embedded within psychology. Um, so what I really like about his work is it's got a lot of application to real-world events. Um, as Dr. Pennebaker mentioned in his talk, he's analyzed various literary works looking at different poets poets who either did or did not commit suicide, and then correlating that with their use of personal pronouns. Um, you can also talk about it um, as a potential lie detector. Um, obviously, we know the polygraph is not a very valid measure um, of lying, because it simply measures physiological responses, right, like elevated heart rate and respiration. Um, but could we use these writing samples as a valid lie detector, um, and would that actually take place and hold up in a courtroom, I think would, would uh, lend itself to a very interesting conversation. Um, and certainly the application of Dr. Pennebaker's language um, research to uh, politics. Um, I know in the past he's looked at the language output of different political candidates, um, like President Obama and John McCain, and looking up what type of language they have in various speeches that they give. And finally, I think one of the real fun places where we can apply this research of Dr. Pennerbaker's is in marketing. Um, in fact, many social psychologists um, go into marketing research uh, looking at consumer preferences and different um, brands that we prefer to buy and looking at how that can be marketed to consumers using different types of language. Thanks. And so we have time. Um, we actually have an interesting suggestion for a study to use in class that I'd like to share from an instructor who's attending today's webinar. Um, and they've suggested, you know, just to follow up on the point about individualistic versus collectivist orientation and language, Dr. Paul Taylor from Lancaster University conducted an LIWC study looking at individualistic collectivist orientation and types of words used in deceptive versus true statements. 
So if you're interested, um, you might want to check out Dr. Paul Taylor's study, and I'm sure you can find that you know, just by doing a quick search online. And Nicole, if I can just, can I add one more comment? Yeah. Um, to follow up on something that Dr. Pennebaker was suggesting, in particular suggesting to the student listeners out there in terms of really harnessing the new technology we have, like some of the Google Labs. Um, I was just seeing yesterday that um, Apple launched its new or revised uh, iPhone, and one of the things that's really unique to it is this new Siri, this voice recognition that they have, where you can actually speak directly into your phone and ask it to find a particular restaurant, and then it will talk back to you. Um, and it would be very interesting to think about how use of language, and in particular maybe the use of pronouns, is informing different um, software development like that. And I know a lot of our students are really technologically advanced and take a look at how language and psychological research can also inform the development of new technology. Thanks. Yeah, really great point. And it is really interesting and relevant. And who would have thought, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that kind of wraps up. We're getting to the end of this session. Um, so I want to really thank you, Dr. Duff, and thank Dr. Pennebaker for volunteering your time to share your insight on both the research and the teaching aspects of this subject. Um, and for those of you on the line, we'd love for you to stay and join us for our next session, which starts at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and that session will focus on psychology and law.